I might wear the lab coat cape, but these are some of the real superheroes in the lab. So what are they? They're centrifugal filters. So yeah, I can't, I have a really hard time pronouncing centrifugal, centrifugal? I don't know. But anyway, these things um, are little devices that we can use to concentrate protein solutions. Um, so I typically use them for proteins, but you can also use them for like DNA or RNA. Um, and so they come in different volumes and you stick your sample in there and then it uses a centrifuge. So this thing that spins really fast. So you put the tube in here and it'll spin it really fast. And what it does is these have a membrane in them. So you have the sample. The sample goes in this little like cuppy part. And this cuppy part has this membrane. And they have different size membranes with um, different size like holes. And so you choose based on how big your protein is. Um, and so we'll talk more about that later, but that's where you get this like MWCO, molecular weight cutoff. So this one has a 50,000 Dalton molecular weight cutoff. So 50 kilodaltons. Um, and so basically you put your sample in there and then when you spin it, it pulls the liquid out. So it's concentrating the protein in here. So I realized that I really had a lot to say about these apparently. Um, and so the video got kind of long. So what I'm gonna do is when I'm editing this, I'm going to cut straight to the point and tell you about um, how to use them um, and some tips and tricks. And then at the end, I will um, go into some of the various reasons why you might, might want to use them. Um, but these include, don't just include concentrating, but also things like um, buffer exchange and desalting. Um, but for now, let's look at how they work. So you have several options when you're doing the centrifuging. Um, and so one of them is what type of centrifuge you're using. Um, so this is a swinging bucket centrifuge. So you can see that like these buckets swing. So when the centrifuge is spinning really fast, your these are going to swing out. So your protein is, um, so your tube is going to go like this. So this is why when you use like a swinging bucket centrifuge, your sample pellet, like if you were doing something with a pellet, it would be at the very end, like in the center. With a fixed angle centrifuge, so this is a different size one, but with the fixed angle, you have like the rotor, where you put your tubes in, is like at a stuck angle. So I, I'm talking about this because there's some differences when it comes to when you're spinning. Um, so with any concentrator, you wanna look at the instruction manual because they're gonna differ from one to one, another. But with the swinging bucket, you can add more volume typically. So like this size will fit four milliliters um, if you're using a swinging um, bucket, but only 3.5 if you're using a fixed angle. Also with the fixed angle, you wanna make sure that the membrane side is up. Um, but the fixed angle, it can go faster so you can get shorter times. Um, so there are pros and cons of different ones. We use the swinging bucket usually. Um, in terms of choosing the molecular weight um, cutoff, so that's another choice that you have to make. So typically you want to choose one that's at least two times, two to, so it's like two to three times smaller than what your protein that you're trying to recover is. So basically if your protein is like 100 kilodaltons, you'd wanna choose like a 50 kilodalton molecular weight cutoff, so a 50,000 Dalton um, or smaller. So the problem with going smaller, so say like a 30K or 10K, is that then it's going to take a lot longer um, to go because there's finer holes that you will have like all the stuff flowing through. Like kind of like if you had a hose with a smaller nozzle versus a bigger nozzle. But you don't wanna go bigger or else you risk losing your protein. So the molecular weight cutoff is really just like an average size kind of of the holes in the membrane. This is not like a fixed thing uh, like a set size. So that's why you want to choose one that's two to three times smaller than the protein that you want to make sure doesn't go through. Um, so it is not 
like size exclusion chromatography or anything you cannot use it to like separate proteins based on their size that's not um that's not what these are designed for and they're not going to work well for that um but yeah so these are all different versions of the 50k for different sizes so you have this 0.5 mil size this 5 mil size and this 15 mil size or i guess this is a 4 mil size um but anyway so this is just one option for molecular weight kf but as you can see we have like all these different options so we have these in like all different so we have 10k 30k um in all these different sizes because we use these a lot so yeah so we use these amicon brands but um they're different brands and they might work somewhat differently so you always want to check on um, the instruction manual but for these we use um like a 4000 rcf um or so 4000 g um speed on the centrifuge um which is the maximum that this can do um and the maximum um that's used for these and um so with these kinds, so with these bigger ones, what happens is, so you put your sample into the cut part. Um, just a helpful hint is that with these, the this part comes out. So when you want to pour the um, like the flow through, so that your stuff should not be in this flow through. But if you worry that it should that you're like can't find your protein or whatever, you can check the flow through. But it shouldn't be in there. But when you go to pour it out, like this cut part comes out. Um, so you want to make sure that if you've labeled your um, this tube, that you don't like then mix up which tube you put it back in because then you're screwed. So be careful with that. Some of them have like better ways where like just the bottom comes off so you can label the part that actually has the holder. Um, but these don't, so just be careful with that. Um, same for, for like, if you don't just label the lid, um, or else when you take the lids off and then you go to put things, then you're like, what the heck is this? Like, yeah, no, that's happened. And it's not good. So, um, but with these ones, so you can watch from the outside when the, like what the protein volume is remaining. Thankfully, these have like a dead stop volume. Um, so it'll depend on the size of the concentrator, but the dead stop volume is like, it won't concentrate it further than that smallest volume. So you don't have to worry about like drying it out and having like, everything go through. Um, but if you have your protein too concentrated, it might crash out. Um, so that's where we it, like aggregated um, and clumped up. And so you don't want that. Um, and so you need to be careful, um, especially if you've never worked with this protein before, that to make sure you monitor it while you're going um, and make sure you don't concentrate it too far. So in turn, so your protein gets concentrated down and then um, you take a pipette and you suck out the liquid. Um, so your concentrated protein should be in this cut part. And so that's how these guys work. With the smaller ones and with some other brands, um, what you have is so you actually concentrate it and then to get like a full recovery, because it's like so small, um, what you do is, sorry, it's hard to do this one-handed. You, um, after you concentrate it, you put it in a new tube and you put it upside down and then you spin it slower, um, but that sucks the, um, the liquid out. And so that way you make sure you, you recover it all. Um, so you're always going to lose some, so you're never gonna recover it all. Um, so you can look, it's typically like 90, greater than 90% or so if you use it as directed. Um, so each of these concentrators will have like a manual you can, you can find online and they'll have um, tips and they'll also have like typical over times to purify based on like the protein size, how concentrated it is, how much you start with, that sort of thing. So typically it can take anywhere from like 10 minutes to hours depending. Um, so sometimes like if you have a big volume, you might have to like keep filling it over and over. Um, and what happens so typically so if it's gonna take like hours or whatever you don't want to do it all at once because what happens is the protein it's going to like kind of like build up at the bottom and so like actually when you go to pipette it out you'll probably notice that it's more like viscous at the bottom so what you typically do is like do 10 to 15 minute spurts and then actually like pipette it up and down to try to um get it 
unstucky from the bottom um, and help things flow better. Um, and yeah, so, but when you're doing that, you wanna make sure like you're not like scratching the membrane or anything, just gently pipette um, in the liquid part. Um, what else? So that's the membrane, the time. Trying to think if there's anything else that I want to say. Oh, storage. Okay. So, oh, so when these come, they have like a small amount of glycerin and like glycerol, um, like a sugary thing on the membrane. And so if the ants, um, that could be a problem for you or whatever, um, or typically even if it's not, what I do is I like pre-wet the membrane. So before I actually put my sample in it, I um, put some buffer in it, just some of the plain buffer, and then I spin it slowly, um, or not slowly, sorry, I spin it for just like a couple minutes um, and let the membrane get like used to the buffer and stuff. Um, then just pour that out. Um, and then put my sample in. And so when I, you do that though, like you wanna make sure that you never let the membrane re-dry. Um, so if you've done that, like don't, like do it just before you do your sample or leave the buffer in there or something. So don't let it dry out. Um, technically these things are single use. As an undergrad, I use them like over and over and over. Um, so if you're using them over and over and over, you want to make sure that you're not letting it dry out in between. Um, and so you wanna store it um, typically, I, I think I used to store it in like an ethanol solution, but you can also do like a water with sodium azide. Um, and so that's gonna prevent like fungal growth and that sort of thing. Um, and also, yeah, so, um, because you don't want them to like re-dry. So they come dry, but you don't want them to re-dry. Um, and also if you're going to reuse them, so you wanna make sure you like wash it out in between, like do a good buffer and water. Um, make sure there's nothing like stuck on the walls and that sort of thing. And typically what I would do is I would only, I would keep track of what concentrator, like I would label it, like only use it for this protein or this mutant protein or whatever. So you're using it for the same thing and don't have to worry about like cross-contamination. Um, and yeah, so those are basically some things about these ultra centrifugal, oh, not the ultra centrifugal, these um, centrifugal filtration devices. And one of these days, like hopefully before I start like actually teaching people, I'm going to learn how to pronounce that better. Um, but until then, um, I just call them spin concentrators. Um, and, but there's more than you can do than just concentrate some, them um so let's talk more about what those uses are so why would you want to do this so there's a lot of reasons why you would want to concentrate a protein one of them is as um in the middle of a protein purification so with protein purification it's often multi-step so i showed you a couple of the different techniques so yesterday we talked about nickel affinity chromatography um or Immobilized metal affinity chromatography IMAC, um, where we used a histag protein and then we used a um, column full, filled with these little beads called resin, and that resin was attached to the metal nickel. Um, histidine binds nickel, so if you put a bunch of histidines on the end of your protein as a histag, it'll bind and come off. Um, and so basically, that's one form of chromatography, and we can use other forms of chromatography, such as size exclusion chromatography. Um, which we often use as a polishing step. Um, so later, like after the iMac, or, um, and so after the iMac, you might actually also do cation exchange, which separates proteins based on charge. But basically all these different methods, you're taking a protein in a buffer. So a salt, a pH stabilized like salt water, basically a buffer. So the liquid that your protein is in. And you're taking it and taking it through these different steps and these different columns. Um, so sometimes you end up with a large volume of your protein um and you might not have that much protein but it's in all this buffer so you have a ton of liquid um and so it's like a huge sea with a couple little fish and it's not very helpful if you want to work with the fish um to have this huge sea that it's swimming in especially for methods like size exclusion chromatography 
Um, so with that technique, you're separating proteins based on their size, um, based on how they flow through this column. And unlike method affinity chromatography method, so with affinity chromatography, you're getting your protein to stick to the resin and then to unstick. With um, size exclusion, you're just flowing it through. Um, and then it'll separate, it'll travel at different speeds um, based on its size but it's not going to get concentrated in the column. So you wanna inject a small volume as you can um, without your protein crashing into the column to get it to work. So that's a common time that we use um, these centrifugal fi filters um, or concentrators. So just, these are Amicons, but there's different brands like Viva Spin, um, Century, Centricon and stuff. So there's a bunch of different brands. But this is just what we use. Um, and so you can, want to concentrate your protein down before you inject it. So that's one reason you might want to use these. Some other reasons are but when you at the end of your purification when you want to store your protein. So going back um, to the idea that we have this protein in a bunch of liquid, you don't want to store a bunch of liquid. That's not very um, feasible. Like our freezers are already stock full of stuff. Um, so just from a pure space for point of view, it wouldn't be good to have all of this huge amount of liquid. But from the protein's point of view, it's not very good either. So when you have a protein in a dilute solution, it's often less stable. And so you can kind of think of like a protein is more likely to be folded if it's in a more like crowded environment, kind of like in your cells. Whereas if you have just like this wide open space, your protein might kind of like unfold. I like to think of it as kind of like stretching out to take up a bunch of space if you're on an empty plane versus like if you're crowded in between a couple people. But you don't want to get your protein too concentrated because then it can kind of like aggregate, so like stick together. Speaking of sticking, when you go to freeze your protein or just stick it in any sort of tube, some of the protein is going to stick to the tube. And if you have a concentrated solution of protein, that's not that big of a deal because it's like a teaspoon in a pool. But if you have just a small amount, like a teaspoon and a teaspoon is a lot. So if it's like, it's kind of like the whole like volume to surface area thing. So my mom really likes Reese's peanut butter cups. But she doesn't like like the mini Reese's peanut butter cups because she thinks there's too much chocolate and not enough peanut butter and the ratio is not good. So in that case, it's kind of like all your most of your protein is sticking to the walls. Um, so you don't have enough of the um, the protein in the middle. With in the case of a normal Reese's peanut butter cup, um, there's more in the middle, um, so less of it on the sides. And so, of course, there, the chocolate would be like your stuck protein, so it's all the same thing. But you get what I'm saying, hopefully. But anyway, with these um, centrifugal filters, um, you can also do one other thing, which is buffer exchange. And so it's a really great alternative sometimes to dialysis to get rid of like salts and like imidazole or other competitors you might have from your affinity chromatography um, steps. And so basically, because salts are small, they're able to flow through the membrane, even though your protein gets stuck. So you can remove the liquid and then like add new liquid that you want your protein to be in. And you'll probably have to do that a couple times if you want to tr exchange all of the buffer out. So with dialysis, what you do is you stick your protein in like a membrane pouch um, and then you stick that in like a big amount of liquid and then you let it go for like hours spinning in this um, in the liquid bath and then the salts will like diffuse out of the membrane and stuff and then you replace the, the, the liquid and then do it again and again and so it takes a lot of buffer and time so this can be a quicker alternative.